acknowledge that it was very unlikely that they would ever be allowed to settle in Britain, and with the monies made on a king's story, the Duke and Duchess decided to lease a country home. They chose a 17th century mill. It was, at, it was about 20 miles outside of Paris, consisting of four stone buildings with a cobbled courtyard and set in 20 acres of land. The following year, they decided to buy it, the first and only home they ever owned. Bathrooms were added to each bedroom, a modern kitchen created, and a swimming pool built. This was to be the Duke's new Fort Belvedere, and over the next 20 years, it was to be the house where the couple felt most relaxed. Well, you know, of course, then they've got to fall to decorating because every house they've ever lived in, you know, you've got to completely redecorate, redo every, you know, you, you, you and I understand, make the house a home, but the amount, I mean, I've lost count of the number of homes they've, you know, completely redone from the ground up. I have lost count. I mean, I should have been keeping a tally. I, I don't even know which house we're on at this point. Apparently, they got John Fowler and Nancy Lancaster from the celebrated firm Colfax and Fowler, and they were brought in to decorate the house, choosing to create in the main house a pink and apricot drawing room with French windows leading into the garden. Depending on how that's done, it might have been nice. But the thing that really blew my mind and that got exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point on the side was that Jesse Donahue paid for the decoration of Wallace's bedroom which was all white with beams waxed to dull gold and filled with a huge four-poster bed covered with pillows. Jesse Donahue is the mother of the guy she's having an affair with, the gay guy who was having an affair with Wallace. His mother paid for Wallace's bedroom to be redone? See, I'm a normal person. I can't understand this. My mind does not make sense. And I don't think any of us can understand this. Can you imagine you're married to somebody, you choose to have an affair with a homosexual and that person's mother pays for you to have your room redone? I don't get it. Well, apparently no one was paying for the Duke to have his bedroom redone because he had a bedroom with a barracks cot and it had, quote, the feeling of a loft littered with golf books, an autographed picture of Arnold Palmer, old 78 RPM records of carousel, sheet music from Gypsy, stacks of old magazine articles and newspaper clippings. What, what kind of a vibe is this? It's like, here he has, he's got his barracks caught, then just a bunch of junk kind of littered around. Heavy emphasis on musicals. What? I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that no one else did it either. The verdict on their final product was not, was a bit panned by the critics who have to come by the house. There was colorful Italian pottery, comfortable divans, stone fireplaces, vivid yellow and flame curtains, and scores of pillows with embroidered messages such as never explain, never complain. It was very bright with patterned carpets, lots of apricot, and really more Palm Beach than English or French, remembered Diana Mosley. Overdone. Medallions on the walls, gimme kipoofs, bamboo chairs. Simply not good enough, was Cecil Beaton's verdict. The designer Billy Baldwin was even more blunt. Most of the mill was awfully tacky, but that's what Wallace had. Tacky Southern taste, much too overdone, much too elaborate, and no real charm. And it does, I tell you though, like Wallace was one for the junky knickknacks. And we're gonna get on later about some of the other pillows that she had, you know, thrown about with her little witty sayings. And you know, I'm just not one for the pillows with the witty sayings, but I just don't get what her her whole look was every i mean overdone yes 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 every description that i've ever read just is like what that is tacky like remember the red and gold bathroom they had i don't know the main guest cottage had two bedrooms and baths and was lined with framed portraits of george the fourth's coronation and a display of the duke's collection of 70 walking sticks 70 why is he keeping all his walking sticks over at the guest house like they want to look at him anyway Everything was geared for the comfort of their guests. With a small bar supplied with whiskey, gin, vodka, bitters, glasses, ice, and all conceivable cocktail garnishes, each bedroom was also supplied with a thermos of ice water, with the newest books on the bedside table, with writing paper and postcards, even stamps, pen, ink, cigarettes, filtered and unfiltered, plain, and mentholated, matches, green folders with the name of the house stamped in white, cigarette lighter, and a radio. I mean, I will say this for them. They are very generous in their hospitality. It would be fun to go stay with them, no doubt, because they wanted the experience to be one that you remembered. So I can see why people were willing to accept an invitation from them, even though the two of them 
were annoying, they knew how to how to host. Um, it would be very fun. I, I cannot lie. I would have immediately accepted invitation. Okay, well, also on the property, there's this 40-foot barn. Um, and what is this barn? Only but a place for the Duke to grieve what he once had. It was converted into a shrine to the life that the Duke had rejected. The walls hung with the pipe banners of Seaforth Highlanders, pigs sticking in steeple-chasing trophies, drums of the Grenadier and Welsh Guards used as occasional tables, 1937 coronation mugs, a frame with a sample of every button used by the British Army during the First World War, commemorative medals, and the Chippendale table on which he had signed the instrument of abdication. What an odd thing to keep. Because it's on that table that you signed away your life. It's so weird that he would just have such a collection of memorabilia about what he once had. But he could have still had it. And I, nobody will ever be able to make it make sense for me. To, to have an entire barn converted, quite literally, as a shrine to the life he once had. Depressing. Uh, meanwhile, they also, of course, had sprawling gardens, traditional English country garden. The Duke was going to take over that. He had a special penchant for gardening, and he especially prized the Duke of Windsor Rose, which an English gardener had created and named for him. Now, what would it have been like if you had gone to stay with them for the weekend? Because it all followed a very strict ritual. Um, the book goes on to say that if you were invited for the weekend... First, the invitation was made by phone, followed by an engraved card emblazoned with the ducal crown in green and crimson, which read, This is to remind you that the Duke and Duchess of Windsor expect you on Saturday for the weekend at tea time. The Duke would be driven down in his car, the Duchess following in a Cadillac with her maids. Is it just me, or is it odd that they needed two cars to go pick up their guests? I mean, unless they had such large parties, maybe that's why. But why does the Duchess need to be following in her Cadillac with her maids? Is it going to be like a quick change or something? Is she going to drive down in one outfit and change into another? Like what? What are the maids coming for? We need the seats for the guests. Anyway, after tea, the guests would retire to bathe and dress for dinner, which was always black tie, though the Duke often wore one of his kilts. Guests would find their cases unpacked, clothes pressed and shoes polished. After drinks in the hall with hot savories served in silver dishes, at 9 p.m., the Duchess led the ladies into dinner. The finest food and wine would be served by the Windsor's livery staff. The meal would finish with the savory, a practice they introduced to the French who claimed it, quote, impossible to eat scrambled eggs after chocolate ice. The Duke and the men might remain drinking port. The next morning, breakfast, which had to be ordered the night before on a menu card by their bed, was served in each room. There would then be pre-luncheon drinks on the terrace and lunch in the barn at two tables, which each Windsor hosted. The guests were then encouraged to leave. How do you encourage somebody to leave? How does one do that gracefully? I'd like to know because I, I, I would like that tactic myself. They hosted many people at the mill. Uh, Marlene Dietrich, Elizabeth Taylor, Cecil Beaton, et cetera, et cetera. I can't ever say any of these French names. And so it makes it sort of um, difficult for me to tell you where it is their next house is. But suffice it to say, they've now leased a new house in Paris that used to belong to Charles de Gaulle. And it's owned by the city of Paris, which means I think that they don't have to pay any money to stay there. The Windsors paid a nominal rent and free security was added to the diplomatic status negotiated by Walter Mockton. Okay, so there's a small fee. It meant that they paid no income tax, their foreign purchases were duty-free, and the profits from their investments were free of tax. The Duke's personal fortune at the time was at least three million. And in today's money, that's 86.6 million, so just so you know. In pounds. Um... They're just always getting around those fees, aren't they? I mean, we all need a Walter Mockton in our life. Look at the way he negotiates for them. Can you imagine? And, you know, Walter Mockton, were they lining his pockets with diamonds and gold? How could he possibly have been persuaded to stay in on any of this? The author goes on to describe the house in great detail. And it's just as lavish, but also gaudy as any of the other houses have ever been. And the theme continues to be great paintings of himself and his family members but heavy on the paintings of himself this time and again all of the memorabilia of the past you you know we've got to find a place for that red box we got to find a place for silken banner emblazoned with the prince of wales coat of arms that used to hang in saint george's chapel at windsor got to find room for that picture of queen mary I, just so many so just 
it's just so lavish. It's just so ridiculous. Well, the other thing that was ridiculous is Wallace's love of these small tables. They were littered everywhere and everyone mentions it too. All of the descriptions of the house of the houses that she decorated. She was really big on bamboo chairs and just little tables to put a bunch of junk on. You know, when you talk about the slave labor that whichever maid had to do all the dusting, I mean, I, I can't even imagine that she was able to use her arm the next day because there's just so much junk to dust all the day. There were small low tables everywhere. Marble tables, lacquer tables, marquetry tables. Some were for cigarettes, ashtrays, and flowers. Others, larger, held the gold and silver caskets, the swords of honor, the Maori green stone war clubs, and the silver lidded rock crystal inkwells that had been bestowed on the Prince of Wales during his empire tours. Other tables held Wallace's collections of china and porcelain with one reserved for 31 mees and pugs. In the corner was a blue and silver grand piano. Just all of this junk, knickknacks, foolishness. The drawing room opened up into the dining room. Why so leading off from the west was the library, which of course they didn't use as a library because neither of them read anything. Um, and they used that for a sitting room. And there in the sitting room was a huge painting of the Duchess. And then across from that was a painting of the Prince of Wales. The second painting of him in his home. Have you ever, in your all your born days, decided that the thing you want in your home is one giant painting of yourself? Not you and the kids, not of the kids, not you and a family member, not any family members that you've ever had ever, which would at least make some sense, but a painting of you, giant. And not one, but two, it must be done. Can you imagine having that mindset about yourself? Um, upstairs, there was an informal sitting room overlooking the garden where they met each morning, took tea and ate dinner on trays, watching TV if they were not entertaining and their bedrooms. At the foot of the Duchess's bed was a chase lounge where she had her daily massage and her assorted stuffed toy pugs were displayed. A grown person who has stuffed animals is a person who I immediately give the side eye to. I don't understand what a grown person is doing with stuffed animals. Now, I can understand in the case of Prince Charles, who still had his teddy bear, there was some significance to it. Remembrance bear, when Harry tried to disparage it, it, was, it just came off very cruel because it was a good reason why he still had that. But I'm talking about people who make a, a habit of collecting stuffed animals as grown adults, especially, I, I just, I, I find it odd. I, I don't understand. And then tacky too, like you gotta find a room for all these stuffed animals. Just yet one more collection of junk. Was she like self-medicating with shopping? I mean, that's kind of a stupid question. Of course she was. Because this seems like the kind of like hoarding behavior that, you know, she's managed to make it not look quite as chaotic as say like on that show Hoarders. But what the need to constantly buy all these little porcelain figurines and this and that and this, you know, left to her own devices. If she were in a situation in which she had no money and she was living by herself, I can guarantee you she, her house probably would look like one of those people on Hoarders. But to add insult to injury when it comes to interior decorating, not only did she have a chase lounge at the end of her bed full of assorted stuffed toy pugs, but the room was scattered with pictures of the couple and their dogs and cushions embroidered with mottos such as, take it easy, don't worry, it may never happen, and you can never be too rich or too thin. And we know she loved that one. The Duchess's bathroom was like a circus tent with the ceilings painted with marquee stripes and hanging tassels and on the walls a fantastical mural of ballet dancers, ribbons and flowers and Cecil Beaton's picture of Wallace in her own bathroom. Now, who do you think this reminds me of immediately? Only one, Meghan Markle. Do you guys remember when we read Revenge and the uh, reporter came to interview her at her apartment and she'd like whipped up this little lunch for him, which she really just bought down at the corner market. And he's sitting in there, it's like super awkward. And she's making her little comments about like, I really like your lisp. What a, what a cool feature your speech impediment is. And he's looking around noticing that her kitchen is covered in pictures of herself. And I remember noting at the time that I thought that was wild because who in their right mind would take pictures of themselves and then put it up in their kitchen. And I thought that was weird. But to get a, a giant picture of yourself and hang it in your bathroom? How much time are you spending in your bathroom and you want to just sit there and stare at yourself? I'll tell you what, the glance I get in the mirror is about all I need. Meanwhile, once again, while she's over there spending a pretty penny on her accommodations, his bathroom was much more spartan and dominated with pictures of the Duchess and their dogs. 
again, are, are these bathrooms like secondary living quarters? Why do you need pictures in the bathroom? You go in, do what you need to do, you get out. As he preferred to shower, his bath was used to store his papers and photos. Again, hoarding lifestyle. Two guest rooms and a bath on the top floor completed the setup.